Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay, and today I have with me in the, in the studio two guests. We have Blue Marsden and Richard Bates. Hello. Now, Hello. Richard has written a book called The World is My Mirror, which is on Nonduality Press. And Blue has a book coming out next year on Hay House called Soul Plan, Reconnect with Your True Life Purpose. And we're going to talk about their lives and awakenings that's happened for them and how they are in day-to-day -day life, which more and more on Conscious TV, we realise that is the key, how we are in day-to-day -day life in our realisations. So, Richard, you describe yourself and as, as an ordinary chap who had an extraordinary experience. Yes, that would be good, yeah. And Blue, you're more uh, quite a complicated person that really learnt how to become ordinary. So, and I know you both have in common, you sent me notes before the uh, interview. When you were younger, you had both had a lot of anxiety and fear. Yeah. yeah. Um, that must have been quite hard. Let's start with you, Richard. How was that for you? Yeah, well, I can't remember a time when I was never anxious, as a small child, I'm the youngest of five boys, so I've got four older brothers, and uh, for some reason I really felt the world was actually quite a hostile place from a very, very young age. And even then I felt that I didn't actually fit in. Other people seemed enormous in my world as a child, and I just felt unable to feel comfortable in, and safe in another person's environment. And the thing is, I was like that in the home as well, although I kept it a secret, or at least I think I did. But it was more when I was out in the environment, and it could be anybody. It could be a shop assistant, it could be a person in the street. There was a sense of, I felt so fragile, and that person had the potential to hurt me. And mm. that, I carried through right through to my adult life as well. Mm. Very, very uncomfortable. Very mm. uncomfortable. And how did it manifest for you, Blue? Well, I can relate to quite a lot of what Richard was saying, but I think it really heightened for me when I was a teenager. And I would describe myself as fairly traumatised and also living in what I'd now call quite dissociated state, dissociated way. There were also symptoms as well, many of the symptoms that um, someone might go to see a mind therapist, like a counsellor or a psychotherapist about which was later to bring me into that trade. OK. So, obviously, it affected your childhood, it affected your character. Definitely. It affected how you related with people and you yeah. saw yourself. Yeah. So what kind of practical steps did you take to try and change this? Was the things that you did in terms of therapy or reading or...? Well, yes, for me, I actually embarked on an open university course at um, age 30 and it was specifically on psychology so I think I was looking for answers in a textbook and so I spent four years um, getting a degree but of course there was an awful lot of classroom discussion which if you're an anxious person it really felt awkward to put your hand up and say actually I don't understand can you run through that mm -hmm. again because there was this sense that actually I was the only one that didn't understand so even though I'd I'd gone into psychology and thought, you know, I'd find an answer. I actually didn't. It was only after the course had finished and, you know, I was, you know, well into my 30s then and I just had enough of being tense, on the edge, uncomfortable and it got to the point where I was in my office one day and I thought, I can't cope with this anymore. Picked up the phone and spoke to a therapist and I can remember that when I was speaking that I couldn't believe that words were coming out of my mouth saying I need some help mm. because that was the first time that I'd heard the words I need some help and then I, I had some therapy. So you had you had the theory and so far as you've done did the course, have the theory. so you had a certain understanding. Intellectual, yeah. But it wasn't embodied no practically. Way. No, no it yeah. wasn't and that is a big, that's the big difference although I would say that even when I went to therapy Although there was certain things which I um, was helped to understand about my childhood, that it, it still even it still wasn't embodied in the sense that I, I would feel better for any extended periods of time. It might for a week or two, but then it would actually, I'd, I'd come back again and say, actually, no, I, this isn't working. Hmm. Was it similar for you, Blue? A little bit different. Yeah. I 
when I was about 14, I was very aware that uh, things were stressful and uh, life was getting very intense for me. And I came across a yoga book. And I started practicing yoga from, from the book. And that helped quite a bit. And that just led into other things. I started exploring Eastern philosophy and um, different therapy techniques, hypnotherapy. I became very interested in self-hypnosis. And I used to um, try and practice meditation, although that was very difficult when you're in that type of state because you get a lot of repetitive thoughts coming through. Mm. And then a little bit later when I go into my 20s, through the, I think it was through the yoga, I'm still not sure how it, um, what actually caused it to happen as such, but a, a kind of spontaneous self-healing process started to take place on a physical level. And I found myself uh, moving into different postures, shaking, releasing, shaking, releasing trauma from the body, um, very much like um, an animal will do when it's been through a difficult situation. There's a great book by Peter Levine called Waking the Tiger. I've read again. that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was almost like that type of process was going on for me, which was actually releasing you know, a lot of held up tension and tears would come out while I was practicing, even though I wasn't feeling sad. So there was something happening by itself. Um, but that was scary as well. And there was a lot of fear around that and you know, having to let go and allow that to happen. It's interesting because you approached it a different way from Richard. Mm. You went to the body. You went more with the mind. Yeah. I mean, it took you time. It took you time with the body, didn't it? It, it is, sounds yeah. like. And a that, long time. <laughs> and that Peter Levine work, that trauma release work, is very interesting. Do you want to just explain very briefly how that works about and why he calls it taming the tiger? I think he calls it, doesn't he? Is it yeah, I'm the tiger? waking the tiger. Waking the tiger. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it's uh, it is a it is a process which can be initiated by, I think, kundalini yoga. There's some branches of kundalini yoga. And there's also some forms of qigong. And actually, I later found um, the qigong route as well. And I, I went and I, I, I explored this and in a more formalized way. Uh, but the idea is that you're connecting with, um, you could call it a life force, self-healing energy, which then begins to rework you and um, and it, it has a self-healing because sometimes as part of this I'd be tapping various acupuncture points as well or um, sitting in different um, positions which would stretch the body out and release. And you were doing this spontaneously? Spontaneously. Really? Yeah. yeah. Huh. And sometimes there'd be sounds that would come out as well, uh, chants mm. and um, healing sounds like overtones, like overtone chanting. And did you feel at the same time your mind changing as well as your body changing? Mm, um, yes, to some extent, but it, it was mainly a physical thing to start with, and there was still a um, quite a big dissociation, which you could call as a witness. So, in, in in some sense, it was a witness. So I was witnessing this happening, but there was questions about it. There was fears about the process as well. So, when you say a witness, what you mean there was another part of you observing what yeah. was going on. Yeah which sometimes, um, sometimes this is seen as something that's good, you know, to get to the state of witness consciousness. But in, in my case, it wasn't necessarily a good thing because I saw it as a very dissociated state. So I was very detached from the physical body, but I was being dragged into it. I was being dragged into embodiment. Right. And that's, we'll come to this later with the whole non-duality thing. That's yeah. one of the, what we may perceive as a danger you become you might be yes. able to yes. exist in a kind of more expanded yes. state, but you were more divorced yes. from your human, your yes. humanness and your, and your the, physicalness. And there were some benefits to that. Yes. You know, there, was, there are some benefits to being detached. Um, but, but ultimately, it wasn't where things were going. Yeah. So let's continue yeah. your story, Richard. So you, you, you kind of you made the brave phone call in a way. Yes, and I did. And uh, I can still remember now actually driving over to the therapist's office and getting out and thinking, can I actually, you know, walk up to that door and knock on it? Because, mm. you know, there was a sense that maybe I was all right, really. Maybe I was just making it up. But I did find the, um, you know, find it in me to actually knock on that door. And um, 
and I can remember actually sat in the therapy room and you know I saw the certificates on the wall and there was the box of tissues on the table and that, uh, there I was and I, and I thought to myself you know what am I doing here I thought you know I'm okay you know I've made a mistake but when I started to actually talk to the therapist it was clear that what I was saying was actually relevant and it was gonna it was gonna help me and I remember the first words that I said and I said I'm so unhappy and I'd never said that to anybody in my life before mm. I couldn't possibly expose myself and say that I was vulnerable in any sense it was like I'd created this wall this barrier and what I showed the world was only a version of me so that they couldn't I couldn't be attacked I suppose it, it was there was certainly a wall and a barrier and it was through talking to the therapist that part of that barrier actually did start to crumble. And I can remember that um, you know, there were certain things that I, that I said which I would never have admitted to myself, but they did start to come out. And it was mainly to do with very early family life and my position in the family. Mm. And, and I found that very, very useful, although it, it, it wasn't the final thing for me. There was a lot more to come. A lot more. Yeah, because one of the things I wrote down from uh, your book was uh, that there was always a battle raging within. There was. And that's quite hard to keep inside, isn't it? When yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, it does vary. Like I think I've said in the book, sometimes it may be a squirmish, sometimes, you know, it's, it is a raging battle. So there's always that background level of anxiety there. Um, and the levels fluctuate. And at, at a peak, you can feel really quite poorly, quite sick, you know, mm. and you really feel that you want to crawl away and just sit in the corner, you know, with your head buried in your knees. You just mm. wanted to shut out that world yes. that was impinging upon you. So did it, did it help with your anxiety? It, it did, it did initially, but there was a sense that actually there was still something in there which actually uh, was still feeding. There was, believe it or not, there was something in me that actually fed on that anxiety, as perverse as that is. So although there was part of me that, that couldn't cope, there was another part that that's all I knew. So mm. if that's all I knew, then that's who I am. I couldn't possibly contemplate that I was anything other than mm. that, even though it was debilitating. So you were the character of Richard based on yeah. the anxiety? Yes, I was. I was identified yeah. with that character yeah. and no other. Yeah. Was that similar for, with you, Blue? Did you feel identified with this character very strongly that you had? Most of the time. Uh, mm. Most of the time at that time I did, yeah. Um, there were occasionally uh, glimpses where I could step out. Um, some of them were these kind of peak experiences that, that a lot of people a lot of people, in my experience, have a lot of clients I, I've worked with have these big experiences where, you know, maybe they've gone off travelling and they're on a beach in Thailand and they're watching a sunset and they have that kind of unity um, consciousness experience. But, but it can also be a euphoria too, can't yes, it? Yes, well, that's what I later came to realise. And I had quite a lot of those. Um, sometimes it would just be driving a car late at night um, when I was a student, I used to work as a minicab driver in the evening um, while I was going through college. And quite often late at night, I'd get into that kind of experience. And sometimes that would just last at the time. Sometimes there'd be a, a kind of euphoria, if you like, which would, which would um, keep going. I could also get it through dancing as well. And, and then there was something else that used to happen, which was... Um, I could be very much in the drama. Um, this was maybe going back a little bit when I was young, more to the teenage years, where I might have a panic attack. And uh, there was one time when I actually went to hospital when I'd had the panic attack. And I'd, I went in and there were some doctors and nurses um, checking me. And then suddenly I kind of stepped out of it and I just started laughing and I just you know, apologised and, and left. And, um, you know, they were obviously quite concerned, but I just, I just went and walked out. So sometimes I could kind of see through the drama of what was so, happening. So what actually happened there, do you think, practically? So you were in the panic attack, it was so severe, you end up in the hospital, yeah. and then you start laughing. Well, were you aware of the switch happening? 
Yes, it was like a sudden realization. It was a realization yeah. in, in your mind, or I, I, su I suppose so. It felt wider than my mind, mm. but it was um, it was it was almost an amusement with you know this is you know part of the drama of life, you know, and that fr that freed me temporarily mm. um, from that time. And then the other time that could happen would be sometimes when I was at school or when I was with a friend, uh, because I had this kind of counselling side to myself. Sometimes when people were going through some difficulty, I'd find myself coming into that role and I could kind of step out of my own issues during that time, uh, which is one, one reason why even now I think... Um, you know, one of the advices that I will give to clients experiencing anxiety is to find some, maybe some kind of voluntary work um, to help you step out of your own problems, to, to help you step out of being self-absorbed. Mm. So something moved you on because you, you went to some non-duality meetings in London in the yeah. late 1990s, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that was a kind of natural progression, I guess, because I... I'd already become a therapist by that time and I started going to these, some, sometimes it was an experience, sometimes there was a kind of what I describe as being an energy there that I would be affected by. And then there was this, this message as well that was coming through and initially I think I began to get this realisation on an intellectual level so it was realised by the mind and that that was the start of a process, another process for me, um, which again had some physical elements because once I'd had that realisation, I started having some, what, what you might describe as unusual phenomena happening. Quite often in my therapy sessions when I was with clients, they, people started um, disappearing in front of me and um, I started seeing people as light has okay. literally light. So their form was changing. Yes, yes, mm. but quite literally, not in a you know clairvoyant way where you shut your eyes and see mm. something. It was actually happening. Uh, mainly people, but sometimes trees as well. Okay. I would see that them uh, as light. That uh, had already been happening before, uh, but it really began to heighten uh, at that time. And I found myself disappearing. At, when I was with a client, for example, and I was just purely having their experience. And that went on so, for a while. So let, let's get this clear. Yeah. So like you became them, is that how it was? <sighs> Not exactly I became them, but blue disappeared. And there was just okay. what was appearing as it happened to be the case. It was someone talking about their problems. Mm. Well, you're, you're nodding yeah. away here, Richard. I know so exactly he's... what he's talking about, yeah. because it is this absence of the, of the person that actually is, is, is really quite revealing. You know, it, it spent all these years accruing knowledge about who you think you are, and then when that gets removed, and there's a sense that you're seeing life, you're seeing events as they are actually happening in the here and now, so there's no in necessary in interpretation of what's happening. There's a sense of not knowing who the person is that is opposite you. Because uh, Blue's experience there mimics very much my experience that I had outside of a supermarket when there was an absence of me. Um, uh, I mean, I can tell the story. Absolutely, you tell know, the story, um, yeah. um, I dipped into non-duality. You went to a Tony Parsons meeting. I went to a Tony yeah. Parsons meeting, um, which I... I got up on a Saturday morning and I didn't even know that I was going to be going. But for some reason or another, I clicked on his website and I looked on his meetings page and there mm. was one in Hampstead. And I live 90 miles away in Warwickshire, so it wasn't a case I could just nip in the car and go. I went to the train station and booked my ticket. I didn't even tell my wife I was going. She probably still doesn't know now that's where I went, but I just went. And, um, and I found the meeting house and I went in. And because previous to that, I'd only ever seen Tony on, on YouTube, and I went and, I, and uh, I sat in the meeting. But after that, there was still a lot of seeking, a lot of searching. So when I was stood outside of the, the supermarket, there was this, I saw a woman, and she'd got shopping bags, a normal situation outside of a supermarket. 
But I found myself scanning her from top to bottom, and there was two ideas running. There was one, yes, I knew that there was a woman standing there with shopping bags, and another that I don't know what on earth I am looking at. And they happened at the same time, so it was very, very confusing. And there was this, just this sense of silence that had actually, a sense of stopping. And then I looked around, and then coming towards me, there was a bus pulling in, because there's a bus station just outside, and it was the biggest, reddest, loudest bus I'd ever seen in my life. And it felt I'd have to get out of the way in a minute, because it's going to come right for me. And, you know, I just couldn't believe it, that, 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 that those, that experience was happening. Mm. It didn't last, you know, it just sort of petered out, and I just simply carried on. But it had an impact, which has stayed with me to this very day, because it was only a glimpse that I needed, and I knew there was something else other than what I'd been experiencing for the last 40 odd years. And it, and it was that when I started to seek even more. Yes, well, you, you say that in your book, that was a real catalyst. Yes, you, it you was. were determined to find out what had happened to you and what yes. that meant. And, yeah, a lot of and, back and who you were, in yeah. fact. Yeah, yeah. So, what form did that seeking take? You mentioned the going to non duality meetings. What, what else did you do? It was mostly looking at uh, YouTube videos, it was um, going on uh, teachers' websites, it was looking at mm. ancient teachings, it was delving into uh, Buddhist teachings and um, reading. And, and every time I read something, there was something there, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't mm. fully grasp it, but th it, there was a felt sense that, s that something resonated in me. So that's what um, I was pursuing. So it was, it, uh, there was a carrot there, and I was going towards it. And, but I had a kind of a, 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 a disassociative state as well, in the sense that I felt that, you know, that there was just this awareness that I was, and that everything else, you know, was just happening in that awareness. But that's a very, I realised, a very isolated way to be, because there's a sense of other people, you know, are almost like second rate in a sense. They haven't experienced what I am experiencing, so there's yes. a sense of superiority which yes. comes with that. And um, and I realised that, and I had to be very careful about um, what I said to people, because I think uh, there's a part where I got quite arrogant. Mm. Okay, well, he's finished. <laughs> my eyes are looking at you. So, if okay. we. And, and, and it kind uh, of. Yes, I'll go just, on. Yeah. Just organically, um, see what I'm drawn to there. I think. Um, well, I know that, 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 that you've obviously integrated that um, feeling of superiority and yeah. uh, initial feeling. Um, that, that was different for me. I'd say that um, that was more of an issue for me before. Um, partly when I was having these more unusual kind of experiences. But since, uh, since I had, um, since I moved into that, into that state of, um, of realization, I'd say that um, there was a humbling process in that. It was, it was, the, it was the opposite, it was um, almost, Almost quite difficult in a sense. There was almost a sense of loss at first with that. I just want to go back a stage because I, I just want to get this clear for people that are listening. Yeah. And before you were talking about a kind of a peak type experience yeah. would happen, and yeah. you realised that in itself would, would come and go very, very yes. easily. Yes. And there's something that I'm going to read, which is a quote from your forthcoming book, which I think explains this very well of what, what you moved on to, which was. Um, what for me at the time was a less obvious progression that was when I experienced a far deeper and unfolding realisation of my essential lack of individu individuality. Yeah. This was quite different from the unity, blissful and peak experience I'd occasionally experienced through spiritual practice, dance and music. This was a far more ordinary yet profound sense of beingness. Yeah. Now talk about that. It was it's more ordinary, but it's more profound. They sound like they're opposites. Those two things. They do, I know. And there is always a paradox with this. But it was, um, you know, for example, before I was, you know, I used to live my life around um, always seeking um, unusual experiences. I was always looking for the extraordinary in the mm. ordinary. And once I began to, what I call, melt or dissolve 
um, which has been an ongoing process, I want to, to stress that, um, into this realisation of non-individuality. Just ordinary things became so much more interesting, so much more, uh, I felt them more. I wasn't really feeling properly before, I think. I think I, because I wasn't embodied. Interesting. So mm. even though in some senses um, there was a realisation that there is nothing as such as an individual, um, the, at the same time the individuals felt even stronger, or the, um, you know, the embodiment experience is even stronger. Mm. Um, so, you know, sort of like jumping ahead to now to nowadays, my life's pretty. Besides the work I do, uh, my sort of social life and um, my everyday life is very much like a family life. And um, you know, I enjoy sort of everyday family kind of experiences. And you know, I do exercise, I play squash, and um, you know, do pretty much normal things. Whereas before, I, you know, I'd be, you know, I'd be seeking more unusual experiences. And the, uh, the seeking part f for me as well re has really fallen away to a large extent. Th there's definitely still an interest in that and I keep a abreast of it. And um, there's, a, there's an interest in doing things which can help to balance you know my physical being, my mental being, all aspects of myself. But what I moved into very strongly from that point, um, which was ten or more so years ago, was much more into um, a sense of purpose and living a sense of purpose and flowing with that sense of purpose as well. And 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 how's the fear and anxiety? Has that has that fallen away? Because if, if we go back a few minutes, you were yeah. saying how, how the, the physical work with the, the Qi Kong and exploring your body, that, that, that helped it, but still a yeah. bit there, though. Is that, That's right. Is that, that, yeah, that had already helped, and um, I'd, you know, through the different therapies I, I explored, in, you know, particularly in my 20s, I got to a point where I was coping, I'd say. You know, which I think is a, a position that many many people are in, and you know, I was also able to help other people who were in more difficult circumstances as well. Um, I was able to help people who were suffering from severe anxiety, for example, even though there was still an underlying anxiety for me quite strong, mm. and I think that that has, to a large extent, gone for me. But as I was saying um, to Richard earlier on, I do, you know, I could still experience anxiety mm -hmm. on, you know, in a normal, everyday way. You know, if something uh, stressful happens for me, but it's less of a, it's less of a kind of underlying, um, all-encompassing, ever-present. It doesn't feel about yeah, for long, does yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's more of an arising. So could we could we say that? The anxiety has dropped away because your sense of identity has changed. Um, yes, yes, you could say that. And uh, and when we were talking earlier, and I was, I was saying that you know part of it is, although it's it's always a it's always a dangerous thing to talk about, but part of it is letting go of some responsibility, as well, yeah. which um, isn't a prescription as such. But, it's, it, but it is a natural um, implication of that realisation. And what does that mean to you, letting go of yeah, responsibility? That's it. I felt that I was holding the world upon my shoulders, that every, I was responsible for everything. You know, I was just mm -hmm. a big guilt. And uh, it, it was that that is absent now. So, you know, I don't feel that I'm responsible for things. You know, you could feel responsible for, for things that were happening in remote countries. I mean, how weird is that? I mean, it's nothing to do with me. But there was a sense of actually being responsible for that, you know, that I, mm. that I was taken on board issues that had nothing to do with me. But there was a sense that that was impinging upon me even that. I mean, that's just crazy. I see it as crazy now. I wouldn't have seen it as crazy then. So, and that is an enormous difference, and you know, and, and anybody that is, that is watching this, um, it is very difficult to describe, but you'll know it 
when you when you realise that there's a there's an absence of a person that's actually responsible for these things, and it you cannot put it into words, and it is it is definitely an ex, an experience, an experiential. Well, I'm going to try because you wrote something about it in your <laughs> Go book. Go on then. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just picked up on this yeah. now. One day, I just saw that separate people, places, and objects out there in the world separate from anything else is untrue. Yeah. This was absolutely known yeah. without any doubt. Yeah. The following period was just a total absence of time, purpose and silly stories. Yeah. Yeah. We did quite well put it in words there. I tried and I think I can, that's as close as I can possibly get to it. But it is exactly that. There was a sense that when I opened my eyes, previous to any awakening experience, the world was pre-existing and what I thought was actual. So if I thought that somebody didn't like me or I felt that was looking at me in a funny way, that for me was my reality and there was, wasn't, I couldn't actually accept any other reality because there was a sense that my thoughts were based upon what another person thought about me. The difference now is I can have a conversation with somebody and it, it's almost like on a level playing field, whereas before they would have been here I would have been down here, but now it's like that, and it's a much more enjoyable way to pass your time a day with another human being. Mm. It is simple things like going out for a nice family meal, having a drink. There's a sense of relaxation in another person's company, and it's so, the smell of coffee, looking, uh, you know, at an animal's behaviour, or just watching a spider spin a web. The other day, only well, three weeks ago, I was watching a spider spin a web and I got so close I was only a few inches away and I was absolutely spellbound and I couldn't say anything I was just watching it and I thought my god this has always been like this but I hadn't seen it yeah so the simple things have become magical and mm. I, I, I like blue I don't need to look for peak experiences or anything like that now because this is enough right here right now it's enough. It's an it's ongoing peak experience in one way, isn't it? In a sense, I suppose, yeah. but there's no sense that you want it to be any different yes. than what it is. So yeah. if there are times when I might be, uh, there may be a little bit of anxiety coming up, that's fine, let it come. It'll come and it'll go again. I'm not going to hang on to it because there's nothing for it to hang on to. I, in my book as well, I say that the liberation is like, you know those fairground grabbers that pick up a toy? Yes. Well, it is like that. You're being picked up, but you're being taken somewhere else into another environment. You are spring cleaned and you're given a coat of anti-static spray. Then the claw picks you up, chucks you right back into it. Everything appears just like it did before, but nothing sticks. And it is that mm. you're not as sticky. Huh. <laughs> How funny is that? <laughs> I like that. Let's just, right. let's just look a little bit more in the sequence of what happened. So you had the supermarket yes. bus experience yeah. we just talked about. Yes, I did. And then that faded away a it bit, did. didn't it? It didn't completely go, but it faded, faded away. And you were looking, you were somehow hungry for that because of the feeling you had, the feeling of freedom, yep. realisation, whatever. Yes. And then it just came back on its own, didn't yes, it? Yes, it did, because the mind kicked back in yes. and said... You're fooling yourself, Rich. Right, yes. You, you are this individual. The world is as it is. So there was this Richard Bates character that was kicking up a fuss. You could say the ego if you wanted. It was kicking up a fuss. And I think there was a fear there that this, um, this pseudo sense of self that had been with me for such a long time was fearing its own demise. So there's a sense of there was something in me that knew that it didn't exist anyway and its story had been rumbled. So it was like a boxer, I suppose. You're having a boxing match and you've hit this guy down and he's gone down, but he comes back up again. He's not quite as fit as he used to be and his punches are not quite strong, but they still hurt. Um, and so that process of that person still being there, you know, he's, he's going to do a few rounds with you. And the, the, there came a point, you know, when I started to believe, you know, this, the ego again, that, you know, what I'd experienced, I hadn't experienced. So I was still battling and finally, that battle is over and there were no winners it was just that Richard Bates had been rumbled Richard Bates has no independent <laughs> existence now Richard Bates the character is still here and he has his likes and dislikes and his moods will fluctuate but he knows full well 
that there's nothing beyond this, and he doesn't exist, at, you know, um, it's contextual. He exists in context only. So who are you then? I, I, I am simply uh, a character that appears in a drama and that whatever the universe is, it has produced me at this point in time, but uh, there's no sense that I will exist in another time. So it's just current. I am current, I am here, there is presence, that's what I am. Mm. I'm not this solid personal identity that I thought I was, that will, was born in the past and that will die in the future. That story has been rumbled because it's not true. Mm. It's pretty definitive, isn't it? Yeah, it isn't true mm. and I know it's not true. No mm. one told me it wasn't true. I didn't read it in a book. I found out for myself. Yeah. And it's interesting, and I, I, I have to look at my notes to get, yeah. get the quotes, but um, you say another part of the book, your advice here, it's very simple actually, your advice yeah. here is to investigate, yeah. investigate, investigate. Yes. And that's what you did. I did. I used yeah. my mind, I, because I treasure, and I still treasure my mind. I don't I have no wish to get rid of my mind. It's very useful. You know, it's, it's great for, you know, if you want to uh, uh, plan some redevelopments in the house and choose a wallpaper. It loves that. Let it do it. It's fine. It will not get the, the non-duality um, message. Yeah. And if you take it, your mind to the limit and, you, and it is sensed that the mind won't get it, the mind will go, and the yeah. mind, mind thanks you for it. it. It was only trying to help. It couldn't do anything. <laughs> thank you for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree with that about the, the mind won't ever get it. Um, it just becomes a kind of over-analytical process. Um, yeah, that, I totally concur with that. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do think that, well, in my experience anyway, I do think that there can be um, a kind of understanding or a clarity that can happen on the mental level mm -hmm. at first. And that in itself, that in itself is enough to help with... Um, the anxiety, some of the anxiety we're talking about, or it can be enough anyway. More cognitive in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's but then it sets in, it sets something into process, um, at least in my experience, which has to be more experiential. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I got my notes <laughs> mixed up here. I'm not sure <laughs> who said what. That's quite a good thing, actually. Um, <laughs> These, these are your notes. Yeah. So, what are other people? What is another person? What's your answer to that question? Um, I mean, another person for me is, is simply an aspect of wholeness. So, um, I can still interact with another person as if they exist separately from me. So, I'm happy for another person to have different op opinions and I'll quite happily have a mm. conversation. But they, that other person has no existence outside of m m my consciousness, if you like. They appear in my consciousness and as my consciousness. So there, there is no separation there. And so I just allow another person to pretend that they are another person if they want to. And I'll play along with that game. So in a sense, there's a, there's a realisation that there is a game going on. And there's no need to change it. You realise that it's a game, that it's a drama. Mm -hmm. And it's fine, it can carry on. You know, you can have a game of Monopoly and know that you're not really buying Mayfair and Park Lane. That's fine. You know, you can just pretend. Yeah. And that's, that's really what it is. There's a sense of th there is a drama going on and, uh, and you're happy to play your part. And th there's, no, there's no need to change it. Very much like a dream. In a dream, there's an awful lot going on. There appears to be other people, buildings, situation, fears, all those kinds of emotions. But those were generated from within somehow and uh, you weren't separate from it because you produced it. You don't know how you produced it, but you damn well did produce it. Do you have a sense of your purpose? Um, no. I just allow life, whatever that is, to simply unfold and happen. If there was a purpose, I guess it would be that um, it would be to be more compassionate to, towards other people who feel that they are individuals and not necessarily because I want to convey a non-dual message to them but there's a, a greater sense of connection between 
me and what I would have called another person. And my behaviour to another person would, it has changed so that I feel that there's more connection there. And at some level, I think that the, uh, the other person now feels more comfortable in my presence because I don't know if you've ever been sat with another person who suffers from anxiety. They make you anxious as well, even if you're not. Mm. And, um, and that's quite, a, it, it's almost you get infected by it. So it can stilt your conversation if another person isn't talking. So you get into it. It can happen the other way around though as well. If, you, um, if you're with someone who's anxious, uh, you can sometimes, you can sometimes then train them into a more relaxed yeah. and calm state, yeah. I think, too. Yeah, I guess so. But, yeah, it certainly can happen that way around. Yeah. You see, from what, what, what you were saying, you know, I feel you have actually found a stronger sense of purpose through the work that you've done and the experiences mm. you've had. Do you want to talk about that, how that sense of purpose resonates for you in a practical way? Well, um, I was a lot more lost when I was younger, I wasn't somebody who you know, had any idea what I was going to be doing in my life. Even, even in the early 20s, um, I didn't really have much of a clue. But what has emerged is, firstly, the therapy work. Um, you know, it's partly through my own explorations and partly through realising that I had some ability in that field. Two things came together, I started working, but but even by the time that I was going to those first non-duality meetings, I'd already been a therapist for several years um, at that time. And I was doing it in quite a casual way. Um, you know, I'd be, I was, you know, I had enough clients to kind of get by. Um, I wasn't um, hugely materialistic. So, um, you know, it was fine financially for me, what I was doing, I was able to go off, off and have coffee with friends and, you know, that would be a big part of the day as well. But um, then, then later, and, and, and since what I'd call um, a no, more experiential um, sense of this has begun to unfold, what's accompanied that is um, a greater sense of purpose. And it's almost, it's almost happened by itself that, um, you know, I found myself, whereas I've run a few workshops before, I begin to put this together into a program now, and that's kind of emerged with the, with the school that I run. So I'm finding myself doing that, and then with the book that I started writing a few years ago, that's just, it's just happened. It, it's, it, it just feels, it feels right, it feels aligned. I'd, I'd, I'd use the word aligned somehow, although that my only hesitation with that word, it sounds like it's something that you, that you have to do and you get sort of like points for doing that. Um, it's, it's, but, it, but that's the nearest word I can find to describing it, aligned. You see, yeah, with you I feel there's, as there's less of you than there was in a way, there's mm. more of you. Yeah. Yet yeah. your interpretation is slightly different, I think insofar as you kind of are, I, I guess there's less of you in terms of neurosis yeah. and conditioning mm -hmm. and yeah. things. Yeah. And there's more of you in terms of your very boom. Yeah. But there's, I, you seem to be a bit more directed than Richard. It's an interesting thing to explore. But Richard's, Richard has written a book as well, haven't you? Yeah. Um, so I'd be interested to, to know how that's come about. What's been? Well, to be honest, I think after I'd had the, I'd read an awful lot, I'd, I'd looked on the YouTube mm. sites, I started to have an awful lot of ideas myself running about in my head, um, but I'm not the kind of person that writes every day. Mm. It has to be um, sorted out in my own head first until I get to a point where I can't hold on to it anymore. And so uh, one day I simply was sat at my my desk in my office and my fingers almost felt as if they had a life of their own and they just started tapping away mm. and I didn't really know where those words were coming from but they just started to flow mm. and within I think it was less than two weeks 20,000 words had come out wow. and you know and I, and I I let it settle for a few days and then I, I, I read it again and I thought did I really write that and I thought and at some stage I thought, what on earth am I trying to say? Because 
I didn't even understand fully what I was writing, so it was coming from an incredibly deep place. And it was only after I'd started to, um, to reread and then to edit it here and there that it really, on a page, started to come together. So it had got from just something that was in here, it became more tangible. Mm. Mm. And I'd had a great fear as a child writing things down because I didn't want other people to know m what my thoughts were. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could be anything. There was a sense that somebody would look at what I'd written and start to criticise. So there was a definitely a fear there, yeah. and that, that was really important to get over that fear and actually start start to write yeah. it, and then it took shape. So that explains how it happened. But in terms of wanting to get it out there as such and get it out into the world, yeah. what what was what happened there? Why how how did that come about? Well. In a practical terms, you think you're talking about now, and also motivation. If yeah, I maybe think. That's not, uh, yeah, not yeah, no, I thought that actually I could help other people. Yeah, I actually yeah. thought that my take on things, because um, you know, my day job is a locksmith. I'm a yeah. very, very yeah. ordinary guy, and yeah. I just thought there must be other people out there that are ordinary, just like me, but are suffering. Yeah. And I thought, well, if I can write a book, which is in part very light-hearted, and if I can show my personality in that book without too much jargon, then I thought that, you know, that it could be useful to mm. other people. So yeah. um, that was probably, you know, the underlying reason yeah. for doing it. It was to, sh it was to share. I did yeah. need to share. I yeah. couldn't keep okay. it in any longer. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, almost like it was, it wasn't you that was, it wasn't all you coming through you, was it? There was something, yeah. there was something outside that comes, use you as a channel. Absolutely. And mm. you're tipping away. Yeah. And as I said to you mm. earlier, you're actually a very good writer. Because some of the non-duality books that we get, are, they're okay, but this is a well-written book. Thank you. Which actually is exceptional. Yeah, I mean, and I think if, if Richard Bates had have written it, the, the old Richard Bates, let's say, yeah. it would have been very stilted. And, it, and for a start off, I wouldn't have been able to write about myself in there because I've got a chapter called My Story where I am quite candid about you know, my yes. early experiences. Yes. And that was a big thing. When I, got, when I wrote that chapter, I knew that that, that book could be complete then because I'd actually put a part of myself in that book mm. which I was reluctant to show the world before and how more public can you be by writing a book about yourself and putting yeah. that in there yeah so we started the interview we've got about five minutes left or so we started the interview talking about fear of anxiety fear and anxiety and you both pretty much you've com completely got over it and you pretty much got over it what would you say to people that say are watching this and they are very anxious, have yeah. a lot, a lot of fear or whatever, because it does seem in both cases there was a quantum jump that happened that went beyond what you were doing that took you out of the box to some extent. So I guess people have to start the journey. Of, uh, yeah, they yeah. do. And all I would say is that um, your mind is there and it is not a hindrance. It is there to help you. And uh, if you if you take the mind and you in keep investigating, eventually it will be exhausted and there will be a sense that actually I'm no longer interpreting the world as I, as I used to before. And a very simple example would be that there are, in your life, whenever an object appears, you are there. That object cannot be separate. You've never ever experienced as something as simple as an apple and not being present. Same way in a dream. If there's an image of an apple, you are there. There cannot be any separation. You've ne in your, if you're honest with yourself, objects have never, ever appeared without you. There's a big clue in that. That's what's worth investigating. Because if you close your eyes, you can't see any objects, can you? No, you can't. Yeah. No. There is... Was, was, was it you that was saying that you know, Douglas Harding was very important to you? Yes, he was. Yes. And it was face to know. Yeah. And, and also yeah. to blue as well. Really? Both of us, yeah. yes, it was. Yeah. Really? I've got a section yeah. on that. Just talk very briefly about Douglas Harding. He's dead now. I, I went to see him once years right. ago as well. Because mm. it's a very interesting work that he does, which um, Richard Lang now is keeping yes. the game. Yeah. Would you like... Well, I, I went to see him probably about 1998, 1999. Uh, what, a meeting he was running in London and it was during the time when I was exploring different, I was going to different satsangs and exploring, exploring this non-duality field and what was great with Douglas was he had, um, I can't remember whether he called them exercises but they were kind of practical experiments, that's what they called them, experiments that you could do in order to um, get a sense of this and of course his 
big thing had been um, the man with no head when he he actually had this realization I think he was walking through somewhere in the Far East I think it was Nepal and he realized he had no head and that was a, another way of realizing this kind of um, non-individuality but he had some great um, experiments that he he facilitated the group that I was with through and one of them um, which I actually actually bring on to my own workshops um, they gave me permission was um, one called the tube where you yeah. have your your head at one end and the other person's got their head at the other end and you're just staring at each other and then there'll be a facilitator who's getting you to really consider what it is that you're looking at and that was quite profound that I found that um, particular experiment um, very profound mm. for me but also you know the presence of um, you know someone who'd been in that state for a very long time because he was probably about 87, 88, 89 by the time I saw him. Yeah. Okay, we have to finish fairly shortly. I'd like you to briefly talk about your school and your work. Mm -hmm. I know you okay. have a London school, don't you? Yeah. Um, so there's a group at the College of Contemporary Therapy and the main one is Holistic Healing College uh, where I run a diploma course it's a counselling diploma, which um, I call spiritual counselling, um, but there's no, there's no kind of religious connotation to that. It's, it's an all-embracing uh, term. And essentially it's a counselling programme where we also incorporate the latest therapies or some you know, tried and tested therapies. So the um, practitioners will learn to sit with people, talk to them when that needs to happen, because sometimes that's the most healing thing. But then there might be other times when they want to um, bring in some kind of intervention, some kind of technique. You know, if someone comes for a comes along with a phobia, you could spend two years talking to them in a counselling way, whereas something like hypnotherapy or emotional freedom technique will um, will usually help someone very quickly. Mm. So they, they learn a range of techniques and a, a way to know how to apply them to the core issue that the client's coming with. Okay, thank you. And you work as a locksmith. Yes, I still work so as a locksmith, a practical man. If yes. someone's locked out of their house. That's it, I'm the man to call. <laughs> so the, do they get a free book when you get well, them back in their well, house? That's an option, isn't it? I could certainly yeah. do that, yeah. yeah. I'd rather not give them away free, mind. <laughs> it's interesting that you, they've got themselves locked out and you find them find home again. Yeah. Let's hope when they walk back in the house they see things slightly differently well, and then you've nice. done a dual job, haven't you? Yeah, that would, that would be good. You could charge double then. I could, yeah. I could, yeah. Mind you, having said that, I remember some of the most enjoyable things for me is when someone's in distress because they need to have their locks changed or someone's left and they need to change them, of sitting down at someone's kitchen table and having a chat. And for me, the locksmith was secondary. I loved chatting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. OK. So, Blue and Richard, thank you very much thank for you, coming to talk to you. us on Conscious TV. And to remind people that uh, Blue's book, which is coming out on Hay House, this is Blue Marsden, is called Soul Plan, Reconnect with Your True Life Purpose. That's out in spring 2013. And uh, Richard, it's January. January, the January 2013. And Richard Bates, The World is My Mirror, and it also fix your locks. That's out on Majority <laughs> Press. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone out there, for watching uh, Conscious TV. And I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.